Stripped tells the story of what happened to me, Thomas Budge, in the years following my high school graduation in 1970. The Dutch Reformed Church, or the DRC, played a significant and controversial role in shaping and justifying the apartheid system in South Africa. The DRC had a close relationship with Afrikaner nationalism and viewed itself as the guardian of traditional Afrikaner values, including Christian morality. Guided by the Church's rigid, principled beliefs, the government crafted societal ideals and moral values around the Church's dogma. The Church fully supported apartheid until 1986. I graduated from high school in December 1970. Peter Willem Boerter, better known as P.W. Boerter, was the Minister of Defence at the time. Boerter initially joined the Osava Brandwach, an Afrikaner nationalist group sympathetic to the Nazis, but later shifted his allegiance to Afrikaner Christian nationalism. He eventually became one of South Africa's prime ministers and the country's first state president. Boerter's father fought against the British in the Second Boer War during which the British interned his mother in one of their concentration camps. The mistreatment of Boer civilians in these camps led some English, Scottish and Irishmen to become the first conscientious objectors in South Africa. South Africa passed laws under the Defence Act that legislated against conscientious objection, criminalising those who resisted military service due to religious, private or personal convictions. The army viewed these defectors as traitors and punished them under the Military Discipline Code. During my high school years, apartheid South Africa was at war with Angola. This so-called Angolan Bush War began in August 1966 and the military dispatched many of its young conscripts to fight in it. South Africa fought the People's Liberation Army of Namibia, PLAN, and the armed wing of the South West African People's Organization, SWAPO, both of which the apartheid government labelled as terrorist organisations, using this propaganda to stoke public anti-communist sentiment. The saying back then was that the army turned boys into men, yet many of the boys who fought in Angola became victims of the war. Decades later, many of these men still suffer from severe post-traumatic stress disorders due to the atrocities the army expected them to commit in the fight against the so-called communist terrorists. In 1967, the South African Defence Force began mandatory conscription, requiring every able-bodied white male to enlist for two years of military service. However, the Apartheid Defence Force never called upon black men to serve their country. This was a patriotic right reserved exclusively for whites. Among P.W. Boerter's greatest opponents was Helen Sussman, a vocal South African anti-apartheid activist and politician. Helen was the Progressive Party's only Member of Parliament for 13 years. For South Africa's white minority opposed to apartheid, this left-wing party was their only legal voice of dissent within the country. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Jehovah's Witnesses in South Africa faced significant challenges. The organization feared that the apartheid government might ban the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the administrative cooperation of the Jehovah's Witness organization. In 1967, police and citizens in Malawi beat and killed many Jehovah's Witnesses, burning their houses, their meeting halls, Bibles, and all Watchtower publications. Jehovah's Witnesses refused to carry a card endorsing and giving allegiance to the Malawi Congress Party. My parents were Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Watchtower Society groomed us children from an early age never to stand during the playing of the national anthem, nor to sing any of its verses. Moreover, 
the organization instructed us never to salute the national flag, attend religious education classes, take part in school cadet training, or actively engage in any competitive sport, as these were said to be against Jehovah's will. Jehovah's Witnesses saw this as political neutrality, but the government, neighborhood communities, and other religious groups viewed it as an act of resistance, even treason. For us children, ostracism was part of our daily lives, and we grew up expecting to be principal victims of religious and state persecution. The Watchtower Society insisted that Jehovah's Witnesses take a stance against military service. Their political neutrality stemmed from a strict adherence to biblical principles, particularly passages like Isaiah 2 verses 4, which speaks of turning swords into plowshares and refusing to learn war anymore. This pacifist position put Jehovah's Witnesses at odds with governments worldwide, including the apartheid-era South African regime. In 1969, the year before my matriculation, as was the case for all young men my age, the law required all eligible white males to register for military service. I refused to do so on the grounds of conscience. And in July of that year, at the age of 16, I appeared before an inferior court at defense headquarters in Johannesburg. There, the presiding officer in charge of the military court-martial gave me a stern warning and convinced me that registering was not an unconscionable act. I relented and filled in the registration form, notifying the defense force that I had become eligible for military service. Two years later, in May 1971, I received my first set of call-up papers instructing me to report for duty in Pretoria a few weeks later. The military had assigned me to their medical corps training center. I never went. The Defense Force then charged me and summonsed me to appear before a magistrate in Pretoria in October of that year. Jehovah's Witnesses who refused to serve on religious grounds faced harsh penalties, including imprisonment. The state saw their refusal not just as a violation of military duty, but as a threat to national security. Imprisoned under harsh conditions, some witnesses, like me, faced indefinite sentences due to repeated refusals. The late 1960s and early 70s were a time when homosexuality was heavily stigmatized in South Africa. The apartheid regime had criminalized same-sex relationships, and the government, influenced by conservative Christian thinking, enforced laws that oppressed LGBTQI plus individuals. The Dutch Reformed Church's stance on homosexuality was rooted in literal interpretation of the Bible, which condemned homosexual acts. The Church considered homosexuality a sin that could be cured or treated. It viewed homosexuality as a moral failing rather than a natural orientation and advocated for heterosexual marriages as the only acceptable expression of sexual relations. The Watchtower Society took a similar view on homosexuality, readily excommunicating, or as they call it, disfellowshipping, and shunning any Jehovah's Witness found guilty of such unrepentant behavior. There was a popular myth among young conscripts at the time which suggested that homosexuals would get a G5 medical discharge from the South African Defense Force. However, the army held a different view, believing that, quote, the practice of homosexuality is considered to be an undermining factor in the SADF, that damages the image of the SADF, undermines discipline, and can lead to blackmail and security risks, end quote. Instead of rejecting gay conscripts from service, the army intervened and tried to change them. Part of the military's management of gay people occurred in Ward 22, the psychiatric ward in the Voortrekker Hoogte Military Hospital. 
Gay soldiers, who could not hide their sexuality, often found their way to the ward because of the trauma associated with victimization. The hospital's psychiatric units were the creation of Dr. Aubrey Levine, who joined the army after qualifying for a medical degree and went on to study psychiatry on military bursaries. He worked under the supervision of Lieutenant General Cockcroft, the South African Surgeon General at the time, who served from 1969 until 1977. Upon his retirement, Cockcroft became active in ultra-right organizations. Levine had a sinister reputation for trying to cure homosexual conscripts. Thousands of gays were subjected to electric shock therapy, hormone treatment and chemical castration throughout the 1970s and 80s. Dr. Levine was convinced he could make heterosexuals out of gay patients. Every new patient was put on Valium, and the ward orderlies carried pistols to prevent escapes. Dr. Levine, who also subjected his patients to narco-analysis, or a truth drug, involving the slow injection of a barbiturate before the questioning began. Dr. Levine does not deny its use. The military pressurized some gay men into having sex change surgery by military psychologists after other methods had failed. The army named this their aversion project. As a Jehovah's Witness, I refused conscription into the apartheid military, which led to imprisonment and solitary confinement. As a young gay man, I struggled to reconcile my sexuality with the strict doctrines of the Watchtower Society and the general expectations, morals, and legal demands imposed by the apartheid government. The audio drama podcast Stripped tells the true story of my experiences as a gay Jehovah's Witness teenager during this time in apartheid history. Music